the bright lights and bling of Las Vegas. But as revelers risk their dollars on the edge of town, warfighters are taking to the skies. By night and by day, American, Australian and British crews set out on sorties in the biggest air combat training exercise anywhere in the world. This is Red Flag. My job is to train the coalition air forces to the most advanced adversary that we possibly can. It's probably the most uh, demanding and challenging exercise from an aircrew perspective. Very, very stressful, and that's the whole point. This huge exercise happens every year, but 2023 has been different. So we're going to find out why. That there is Las Vegas. You can see how close we are to the city itself. And over this way, the vast expanse of the Nevada desert. And today's missions are just beginning. Red flag began almost half a century ago when the US military realised from Vietnam that if pilots survived their first 10 missions, the chances were they'd survive the war. Red flag was born to simulate those first 10 perilous sorties. Red flag, the most realistic combat training exercise ever developed. Today, the exercise is bigger than ever. There's now three a year. This is red flag one, and it's huge. So this is the British flight line. We've got all our typhoons nicely lined up. Next to us are the Australians. They've brought their four growlers with them. And beyond them are the US. Now there's around 100 jets here, and this stretches for over a mile. Although the goal remains the same, after years of looking eastward, now attention turns to a new threat. The red flag scenarios during Red Flag 23-1 are 100% focused on the pacing challenge in China. Uh, we present the blue participants with both offensive and defensive counter problem sets every uh, training period that they're uh, participating in. The big challenge now is what the Americans call the tyranny of distance, the miles a task force would need to cover just to reach the fight. They could also be operating over water, not land, and potentially fighting a well-equipped enemy. To tackle the tyranny of distance, they've almost tripled the airspace they're training in. It now stretches from Utah, across Nevada, into California, and for the first time over the Pacific Ocean. All the nations involved bring their own expertise to the party, and this problem of distance means what the British bring is key. We wrote it yesterday before yesterday at seven in the morning, fixing the pod. The Voyager is the RAF's air-to-air -air refueling tanker. It's basically a civilian airliner with a few handy military adaptations. It has two underwing pods for refueling fast jets with an additional center hose for larger aircraft. It can refuel two jets at a time, delivering half a ton of fuel a minute, with each jet taking around five minutes to refuel. It complements the US tanker, the KC-135, which uses a single rigid boom and is better for refueling bombers and larger aircraft. The hose is about 99 feet long, and you'll just see the basket tucked up in there, and it'll come out behind the aircraft and just sit in the airflow here, and then the receivers come up with their probes, and then their job is to prod their uh, probes into the basket uh, at about 400 miles an hour. The Voyager is effectively a force multiplier, enabling aircraft to stay airborne for longer. She's therefore critical to this year's red flag. So although this, to all intents and purposes, looks exactly like a civilian airliner, we are essentially an international airborne fuel station. We hang out on the edge of the training area, ready, waiting to refuel the British Typhoons, the US Marine Corps F-35Bs, and the Royal Australian Air Force and the US Navy's Growlers. OK, Sophie, what are we expecting? Um, OK, so we're going to expect a couple of Typhoons um, in the next 20 minutes. Um, and then the second wave, we've got some uh, F-35s coming. Busy? It is very busy. I mean, these guys are just so busy. So I just try not to talk to them. They need to concentrate. Yes, <laughs> they do. It's not long before the first customers arrive. Up front, the mission systems operator controls the refueling. Today, the Voyager has 50 tonnes of fuel to deliver to 18 aircraft in around 90 minutes. Meanwhile, the job of the pilots is to fly straight and level. Very still, very steady, very predictable. Um, 
we don't want them to be disorientated while they're around the aircraft. We want to provide a nice steady platform for them to come and get their, their fuel. Uh, as you can imagine, it's like a big flexible hose. It bounces around if there's any uh, bumps or turbulence. So it's hard enough as it is, so anything we can do to make it easy for them, uh, we will. The jets come and formate on the left-hand wing. Um, that's kind of like the holding area. And then two at a time, they'll come one behind each hose. They'll then connect when they get the green light uh, to say they can take their fuel. When they're finished, they'll disconnect and then they move off to the right-hand wing, which is kind of the holding area before they leave. And then they'll climb up above us and head back uh, to their flight. The Voyager is a very critical enabling asset, what we call a high-value asset. So what we tend to do is make sure that the Voyager is protected. We don't want the Voyager near the enemy forces and we always want to have blue forces, fighters, in between the Voyager and the enemy. So we would have fighters protecting the Voyager, we'd have fighters up front fighting the enemy, and we'd also probably have fighters on the Voyager refuelling as well. Whilst we brought our typhoons and tanker, the Australians came with their growlers. The EA-18G Growler is an electronic attack aircraft designed to scramble enemy communications. It's a pretty important exercise for Australia. Um, for us, it really includes incorporating into packages of up to 60 or 70 aircraft um, to achieve uh, various mission sets. Our task or our mission set is really to enhance the survivability and lethality of uh, the joint and coalition force and we do that by denying or degrading or deceiving uh, enemy communications or RF equipment to make sure that the, the Typhoons, for example, can achieve their mission set. It's not just the scenario putting the visitors to the test, the cold winter desert also has its challenges. Well, it's used to being in such warm climate and now it's like freezing and we're just like, oh, what is it going to do now? But we always figure it out, it's great. They may look simple, but they're really not. There is so much design that's gone into them and so much information that you've got to learn about it to be able to fix it or troubleshoot it. As the Allies evolve, so too does the enemy. To keep coalition forces on their toes, Nellis Air Base has a unit of resident buddies. Their job is to provide red air, in other words, to get amongst the blue friendly forces and do all they can to disrupt them. Last year, they became even more lethal when they were joined by a new squadron of F-35s, headed up by Commander Norso. This is their first international red flag. It's a challenge uh, to, to a certain degree. Uh, I think the baseline you start that, um, start as your best fighter pilot that you can be, is the, is the absolute baseline, uh, whether from the enemy or from the good side. But then now you have to put yourself from, in the mindset of the enemy that you're you're hitting the, the, the missile launch, the simulated missile launch button against your friends out uh, there. And you, you can't be afraid to do that because any hesitation uh, in doing that means that your friend is not getting the best training that they could possibly get. Another day, another mission. They need to be snug so that um, when you're pulling G in the aircraft, the, uh, these pants inflate and squeeze squeeze the blood back up to your torso and into your, into your brain so you, you don't lose consciousness under high G. They need to be tightly fitted. Um, after a few weeks in America, um, is a challenge to get on in a hurry. <laughs> Do you have to psych yourself up for going out for a sortie? Uh, you certainly need to put yourself in, a, in, a, in the right frame of mind. Um, also, they have rock music in here, which, which helps as well. Get into the mood, clear the mind. Yeah, out here you get a uh, kind of a big match mindset. So um, with so many people watching as well, um, you don't want to let each other down and you want to give the best best performance you can. So absolutely, uh, well, I definitely still get nervous. Bit of, bit of rivalry with the Americans and the Australians as well at all? No, not at all. We just want to uh, get the bad guys. Black Hawks provide cover as the B-52 strategic bombers depart first, then the tankers and the fast jets follow. There seems little doubt amongst the 3,000 or so deployed that Red Flag is working. You said you'd, you'd only died once, is that...? <laughs> yes, so, uh, oh, do we have to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> it was my first mission. I was taken aback by the, the aggressiveness of our adversary. I haven't died since, so uh, I learned my lesson, I like to think. I was the last guy to get gas from my flight, and I look over to my left, and I see four typhoons over to my left. I, it was just, you know, a, a surreal moment. I, like, couldn't believe that I 
like whatever choices in my life brought me to that moment. It was it was beautiful to see. I feel exactly where I want to be. You know, it just feels right being here. As red flag draws to a close, coalition forces prepare for the long journey home, and Nevada looks to future red flags, which may be conducted entirely at sea. Panicking Forces News, Nellis Air Base, Nevada. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.